We're starting this series on uh, Compassion by Command. Uh, the title of this message is uh, Seeing What God Sees. The titles for these messages were planned out a while ago, and, and we're going according to the booklet, so that's the official title. Sometimes the message will uh, correspond to the title closely, other times not so much. Uh, this morning's is not so much. Uh, so I'd like to subtitle this uh, Justice, Humility, and Compassion, or Justice, Compassion, and Humility. Uh, it comes out of Micah chapter 6, verse 8 a very famous passage that reads like this. He has shown all you people what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? This is what's good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what the Lord requires of you. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Pray with me here for a moment. Father, I pray, God, that for every person in this auditorium and every person who maybe is listening through podcasts or some other means, that you would open up our ears and open up our hearts to receive your word. And we pray, God, that, that uh, the kingdom would come, invade our lives, and that you teach us what it is to walk justly and what it is to love mercy and what it is to be humble. And, God, that you'd help us to wake up to the many ways maybe in which our culture has indoctrinated us, and the powers behind the culture have co-opted us and that have kept us from living out the just, the merciful, and the humble kingdom. Wake us up, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 What does the Lord require of thee? To act justly. That means to live with a view towards justice, to promote justice. It means to confront injustice and to confront oppression. It means to live in a way where you strive to alleviate inequities. That's what it is to act justly. To love mercy. Mercy has the connotation of, on the one hand, forgiveness, where you give someone not what they deserve, but rather you express kindness towards them but it also has the general connotation of of just being compassionate, to have mercy on someone who is less fortunate than you. It's to be compassionate. So what does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to love compassion, not just be compassionate, but to love being compassionate and merciful. And then to walk humbly. To walk humbly means you just live in a way that's free of arrogance, free of judgmentalism, and free of self-righteousness. That is what the Lord requires of you. Act justly, be compassionate, and be humble. Now, what is interesting to me is that that answer is the main thing that Micah says the Lord wants of us. But it's not the main answer that many people today would give to the question, what does the Lord require of you? Uh, My suspicion is that if you were to ask most Christians, uh, what does the Lord require of us? Or the way we phrase it today is more along the lines of, uh, uh, how do you get saved? The answers would be along the lines of what we believe. Here's what the Lord wants us to believe. You need to believe the right things. That's the important thing because that's how you get saved. So you need to believe certain things about Jesus and believe certain things about the Bible and believe certain things about uh, maybe eschatology and the rapture and the creation or whatever. And those beliefs are all fine and good, but you wouldn't find Micah's answer, I don't think, at the forefront of most people's answers today. They might have some behaviors. You, know, you have to believe the right things and also you need a quiet time with God. Uh, you know, do your devotions. Maybe they'll talk a little bit about standing up for particular causes. But I don't think, on the whole, most Christians in the West today would answer the question, what does the Lord require of us, by saying, well, we need to live uh, to promote justice and confront injustice and confront oppression and show compassion to the poor and, and walk humble. But it is the main answer that Micah gives. In fact, it is the main answer that the Bible on the whole gives. A lot of people don't realize this, but the Bible from beginning to end emphasizes this uh, as as much as any other topic you'll find. There are over 400 
distinct passages in the Bible that address issues of poverty and greed and wealth and responsibility. Over 3,000 particular verses address this topic. The Bible is saturated with this. Over and over and over again, God calls his people to practice justice, to have a heart for the poor, to home, uh, provide housing for the homeless and food for those who are hungry and to care for the widows and, 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 and those who are under oppression. It, the Bible is saturated, just saturated with that theme. In fact, greed is the second most frequently mentioned sin in the Bible. The first one is idolatry. And I would argue that greed actually is simply a form of idolatry. It's pervasive in the Bible. In fact, the number one reason why God judges nations in the Old Testament is because of their greed. Greed is simply a matter of hoarding more than you need when there are people who have less than they need. Hoarding more food than you need when there are people who are hungry, that's called gluttony. Hoarding more resources than you need when there are people who don't have enough resources, that is greed. And the number one reason why God judges nations in the Old Testament, including Israel, is because of their greed. This is a topic that is central to God's heart. I don't think you could get a topic that is more central to God's heart than this one. And here's where I have to be very honest with you. I am just puzzled, perplexed, bewildered sometimes by some of the priorities that it seems modern Western Christians have. Our priorities sometimes strike me as being screwed up. This doesn't seem to be on the forefront of a lot of people's uh, passions. I would think, wouldn't you, that, that you know, for people who, who read the Bible and, and, and believe the Bible and, and that they would share the values of the Bible. And if that's the case, uh, you know, I, I would think we'd be hearing more about this, especially when you consider this. If ever there has been a nation, remember the number one reason why God judges nations in the Old Testament is because of greed. If ever there was a nation in history that could arguably be accused of greed, hoarding more resources than you need when there are, are, are people who don't have as much as they need, I would think it would be America, possibly. And if ever there was a people, uh, a group of Christians who were guilty of a particular sin, I would think it would be greed and be among modern American Christians. We live at a standard of living that is four times the global average. And yet all of the studies show that we spend on average 90%, 97% of our income on ourselves. So the number one reason why God judges nations in America is in that category and God's people in America uh, are in that category. And so wouldn't you think that people who share the values of Scripture, given how, how, how saturated the Bible is with this emphasis, wouldn't you think that Christians would be just confronting the injustice in the church and, 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 and getting just passionate about this topic and saying we need to be living this out and if they're going to be taking it to the streets, they'd be uh, out there on behalf of the homeless and, and those who are, who are uh, in poverty situations. You would think that their feathers would be getting, our feathers would be getting ruffled over this topic. It seems to me that we don't get very bothered by this topic. Honestly, it seems, what, 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 what gets a lot of Christians, my impression anyways, is that what gets a lot of Christians, their feathers ruffled, what gets them you know, really passionate about some stuff is, is when they uh, you know, are, are go after gay rights. They're, they're passionate about that. They'll take that one to the street. Um, but this one, not so much. There's a lot of energy and emotion that gets poured into that. And yet, having done all that to go back, and, and many don't even question their lifestyle, their own lifestyle, the houses they live in, the, the, what they do with their resources. There's something wrong with this picture. 3,000 verses that deal with poverty. There is, at most, six that address homosexuality. What's wrong with this picture? There's a lack of perspective on this, and I'm not trying to condone homosexuality by any means. I'm just saying there's something wrong when, some, when, when we ourselves are so potentially indicted by this thing that's so central 
to God, and yet rather than looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, how would God have us change, we want to scapegoat and deflect responsibility and go after these folks and say how they have to change. Here's the irony of this. Here's, it, it, here's the irony. We get the word sodomy, which has been for the last couple hundred years synonymous with homosexuality. We get that word from the city of Sodom, which along with Sodom and Gomorrah was in Genesis 19, judged. And uh, the traditional interpretation is that it was judged for its homosexuality. And there's some indications in Genesis 19 that that had something to do with it. But here's the irony. The one verse, the only one passage that fleshes out in some detail why God judged Sodom does not mention homosexuality. What it does mention is greed. Here's what the verse says. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom, he's talking to the Israelites here, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. In other words, he's saying to his people, uh, you, got, you, you are in a worse situation than Sodom was because you're not practicing justice and showing mercy. He goes, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. Listen to this. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. Arrogant, they did not walk humbly with the Lord. Overfed and unconcerned, they didn't act just. They didn't show compassion. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. To not care about the needy and the poor is to God detestable. Therefore, he says, I did away with them as you have done. Here's the irony. If ever there was a nation that was guilty of the sin of Sodom, it's this one. And if ever... The, there were a group of Christians who were guilty of the sin of Sodom. Uh, it is this one. Uh, and yet, it's, you get the impression from a lot of Christians today that the, the, the only sin of Sodom we should be concerned with are the, those who are guilty of that sin that's mentioned uh, three times in the New Testament. We ourselves can, are sometimes guilty of the sin that is mentioned 3,000 times. What's wrong with this picture? I almost honestly entitled this message, Will the Real Sodomites Please Stand Up? But I thought that might offend some people, and you know I never like to offend people, okay? So, <laughs> but what's wrong? Do you see the irony of this? We are guilty of the sin of Sodom, let us, many of us anyways, and let's confess it as a nation and as a church. And yet rather than looking in the mirror and, 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 and saying, God, you know, point out, as we sang earlier, point out the sin in us, we're scapegoating, deflecting responsibility, and, 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 and pinning it on other people. It's time for this to change. It's time for us to gain some, a holistic biblical perspective and to begin to share God's heart for the poor. And I'm not trying to minimize any sin whatsoever. I'm just saying, you know, this, is, this is Matthew 7 on, on steroids. When Jesus says, don't go looking for the, the, the speck in your neighbor's eye, but look at the two-by-four in your own eye. It's time for us to say, let's deal with our two-by-four in our eye. This should get our feathers ruffled up. This should get us, our passions going. This should get the fire going in our life. This series is all about that. It's about Micah 6. It's about learning how to act justly and live with compassion and to walk humbly. It's asking the question, what does it look like here and now for us? to act just and to be compassionate and to be humble? And how do we move forward in the radical kingdom on, on growing in this? It's all about that. I want to now focus on, for the remainder of this message, focus on the last part of Micah 6, that part about humility. Because sometimes I think when we look at Micah 6, that is sort of seen as the addendum. The important thing is to act just and to show and to love mercy Walking humbly is sort of seen as, oh yeah, a little addendum. But I believe it's as central as the other two. In fact, I will argue that we can't do the first two unless we do the third. Uh, it's our lack of humility, I believe, that to a large degree keeps us from living justly and uh, uh, loving mercy. On the issue of poverty and wealth and responsibility... As much as anywhere else, if not more so, we need to be humble, which means we need to know what we don't know. That's humility. We need to collapse our judgment mechanisms. 
which tend to uh, file people and issues in certain categories. We're locked in our judgments, some of us, and it keeps us from learning what we need to learn in order to live justly and to show mercy. It may be that some folks here already have had their judgment mechanism, their own addiction to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what judgment is all about. It may be that you've already had that triggered, and you've already made judgments that are going to try to block you from hearing the rest of this message. Judgments like, oh, here we go again, he's minimizing homosexuality, or here we go again, more of this liberal stuff, or we're going to be beating up on the wealthier, or what have you. And see, if you have those kind of judgments, well, it will keep you from receiving the word fully and keep you locked into whatever you're locked into. If we're ever going to live justly and learn how to love mercy, we've got to start with humility, knowing what we don't know. Now, there's two kinds of judgments I want to talk about here, and they're both very important. There's the judgment of the affluent uh, towards the poor. And by the affluent, I mean, or is it affluent? Affluent, affluent, right? Uh, the affluent are, are those, I will just say, who have their needs met. You don't live worried about meeting your basic needs. And the poor are who, those who don't have the resources to meet their basic needs. So there's a judgment that some who are affluent have towards the poor, but there's also a judgment that the poor can have to the affluent, or those who are in solidarity with the poor can have to the affluent. So I want to talk about both of those sorts of judgments. First, let's talk about judgments towards the poor. Sometimes you hear, or maybe you don't say it, but you think it, or some people are thinking it, things like this. Um, you know those poor folks, if they, if they, would, if they would just in this land of equal opportunity, if they would just work hard, if they would just be less lazy, they wouldn't be poor. I work hard. That, that's, that's how come I'm not poor. So if they would just work harder, uh, they, they wouldn't be so poor. Or, you know, if they, would just, if they would just take care of their property more instead of trashing their apartments, well, then, then that, that would help them get out of poverty. Uh, if they would just stop doing drugs, uh, that would really or get off of alcoholism. That, that would help their, their, get them get out of poverty. They wouldn't commit so many crimes and have so many uh, folks in prison. Uh, well, that would really help their poverty. There's a, there, there's a, a lot of evidence that shows that, that, that there's a correlation there. And if they would stop having kids out of wedlock, that would really help them get out of poverty because there's a lot of studies that show that uh, kids being born out of wedlock contributes significantly to the poverty rates. And if they just managed their money better and didn't eat out of fast food restaurants all the time and, and, and were just better stewards of the resources that they have, they wouldn't be dealing with, uh, they, they could get out of their poverty. They just would prioritize better. I mean, how come so many poor folks have got large, you know, uh, flat TV screens and, and have cable television and, and great stereo systems and drive in cars that a lot of middle class folks don't even have? You know, so, it, so that, that's why they're poor. So the judgment goes. And we think we know. We think we know. And what's really convenient about that kind of process of judging, thinking we know, is that if that's true, well, then I'm off the hook on this one. If that's all true, then it's just their fault. If that's true, then I don't have to really worry too much about how I live and how I steward my resources uh, because it's their own fault. It's, very, it's a very convenient judgment to have. Or what can happen is that uh, folks who have that judgment but still have a kind of compassionate heart, well, what happens to them is they become uh, the fixers of the poor. Since I know why folks are poor and I've got resources, I, the righteous and wealthy, will help them uh, live out the American dream a little bit better. And so we, 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 we dance into their poverty zone and we show up with the money and we show up with all of the know-how and whatever and we're going to fix them. That's what this is about. We're going to fix this problem. And the heart is in the right place, but see, because it's lacking humility, it never works. It comes across as extremely patronizing. Folks will certainly probably take your money, but you aren't going to do anything to really alleviate the situation long term because you go in thinking you know what you don't know. If we're going to, if we're going to live justly and live with compassion in any way that makes a difference, I'm talking to the affluent here, we ha it has to start with humility. And saying, we don't know. We don't know. And that means we need to learn. That's why a core of this whole series is going to be about, and this whole conference that we're, we're putting on at the end of October, will be about learning. Uh, to, to be in relationships with people who are from a different socioeconomic strata than you are. 
and to get on the inside, get on the inside of their experience and begin to see how things uh, you know, maybe work in their life that contribute to poverty and develop compassion out of these relationships. But it has to start with humility. That movie that we, we, we promo that's no longer available, uh, that is one way that a lot of people have found it helps them begin to get a bigger picture of get out of our judgments and begin to get a more realistic perspective of what keeps people stuck in a cycle of poverty. Now, it is undoubtedly true, undoubtedly true, that, uh, that uh, having kids out of wedlock, for example, contributes to poverty, for sure. And doing drugs contributes to poverty, yeah. And, and the crime rate contributes to poverty, absolutely. There's a lot, lot, of, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. But see... Those are generalizations and stereotypes. They don't explain anything. Right? There's some principles there that are true, but it doesn't explain anything. Even in cases, individual cases, where it maybe applies. This particular person is lazy. This particular person had a child out of wedlock, and that's why they're poor. Even when it applies individually, it doesn't explain anything. Uh, Without taking away personal responsibility at all, think about this. How many people do you know who have all the opportunities in the world in front of them? Because this is a land of equal opportunity, right? And so they look at all these opportunities, and they wake up one morning, and they say, gee, you know what? I think I'm just going to flush those all down the toilet, and I'm going to go out and get me some drugs and have a couple of kids out of wedlock, and I'm going to uh, you know, just commit some crime and get thrown into prison. Why? Because I want to be poor. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that, which means that maybe we need to look at a bigger picture and ask the question, what is it that contributes to those sorts of decisions? Without alleviating personal responsibility at all, we have to look at the possibility that there are things in the system, things in the system that perhaps advantage some folks and disadvantage others. Uh, perhaps there are some things in the system, systemic aspects of society, fueled by principalities and powers, that privilege some and disadvantage others. Maybe the cards are stacked a little more in the favor of some and stacked against others. Now, it may be that here, all of a sudden, some folks had a little trigger go off. A judgment came in. They said, oh, here we go again. Uh, talking about privileges, all that liberal mambo-pambo. Some people are privileged. Some people are disadvantaged. This is the land of equal opportunity. And now we're going to go off in this old liberal thing where we're going to blame the system. Consider the possibility, if you just had that thought, whether you're here or on podcasts, that the reason you thought that was perhaps because you yourself are privileged. And it's one of the privileges of the privileged that you don't have to know that you're privileged. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It, it, yeah, you know, one of the privileges of the privileged is that you get to call your privilege normal. This is the ordinary, this is the normal, and you assume that everyone has that because you don't bump into the same kind of walls that those who don't have that privilege bump into. And the only way you're going to learn about those walls and those other things that you're oblivious to is by humbly learning from others who don't have that privilege. But it's uh, invisible if you have the privilege. It's why it took me over three decades to really wake up to the reality that as a affluent white male, I had some things stacked in my favor from the start. I didn't know that, but I did. And I thought everybody had the same thing, but they don't. And see, if we're going to get out of our judgments and begin to act justly and begin to wake up to the systemic things and move with compassion rather than judgment, we need to start by being humble, learning and listening, walk humbly with our God. So throughout this whole series, we're going to be st stressing the importance of dialogue and the importance of listening and the importance of relationship building. And instead of trying to fix the poor, we're going to be emphasizing being with the poor. And, and, uh, and walk with the awareness that we can't hope to serve the poor, talking to the affluent here, until we first learn how to learn from the poor. We want to be empowering folks who are, are or have been in poverty to be the educators of the rest of us. And let us in on a world that maybe we would otherwise not be aware of, like the song uh, that we sang earlier uh, pointed to with the Doobie Brothers. Uh, you don't know me, I'm your brother, but, you, but our worlds are very, very different. 
We need to have our lives enriched by the poor and educated by the poor before we can ever learn how to effectively serve the poor. So those are the judgments that the affluent can have towards the poor. And to go forward, we need to collapse those and just humbly learn and listen. But there's also a judgment that can go the other way. A judgment on the part of the poor towards the affluent. Or a judgment on the part of those who really, have got, who really get it and are in solidarity with the poor against the affluent. Uh, this is actually one of the oldest judgments in the book. This is as old as humanity itself. It's called class envy. And in class envy, what happens is you look at those folks who've got a bigger slice of the pie than you have, and you resent it. And uh, you, you say to yourself, to those in your class, you know, if they would just give up some of their overly sized slice of the pie and give it to us, the world would be a fair place. We want what they have, class envy. And... Uh, You find this going throughout history. In fact, some political systems are there to sort of force those who have a bigger slice of the pie to share it with those who have a smaller slice of the pie. Uh, Marxism being the the, the classic case of this, where you sort of impose a standard of fairness on the pie. And so we're all going to share it. Now, I don't care what your politics about that may be, but that motive of resentment and envy has no place in the kingdom. The way the judgments sometimes look in, in, in Christian circles is something like this. And, and in my experience, the ones who tend to have this the most are those who have sacrificed a lot to be in solidarity with the poor, which is really praiseworthy. But then they can turn around and, and judge others who haven't followed that pattern. And so you hear words like this, and I've heard words like this. Maybe you have too. You can't call yourself a Christian and live in a house worth X amount of dollars. You're a hypocrite. Or you can't, no one who drives a Lexus can say that they are a Christian. No one who wears those kind of clothes, those nice expensive clothes, can say that they're a Christian. No one who eats that kind of food can call themselves Christians. No one who's really a Christian can shop anywhere other than a thrift store. If you you go to Saks Fifth Avenue or one of these other expensive stores, well, there's no way you can call yourself a Christian. It's about judgment. A judgment towards those who are affluent. I've myself been the recipient of some of these at times, uh, and they're not fun. Here's one example. About uh, 15 years ago, my wife and I were living out in the suburbs, and uh, we moved out of our starter home to a little bit bigger home, and it was really a nice house, some nice property, and we were enjoying it. And I mentioned it from the pulpit one time. Somebody uh, took the trouble to go find out where we lived and look our house over, which is kind of scary. Our, our, our own little private house inspector. And then this person uh, confronted me uh, after a service. And I didn't know who this person was. They had just been attending the church for a little while. But it was one of these people who had given up a lot to enter into solidarity with the poor. And just said, I can't believe that you live in that house. How dare you call on us to live compassionately towards the poor and with generosity. When you live in a house, that house has got to be worth a half a million dollars. How dare you stand up in the pulpit and, and, and as a representative of the gospel and live in that kind of house? Now, I, I responded by saying this. And I was gentle. I you know, was loving, kind. I always am. I'm so righteous. But I just said, uh, I just, and modest. But, but I said, oh, I forgot. This is a sermon about humility. <laughs> Scratch that one. But here's the thing. I said, uh, well, first of all, you've really overestimated the cost of our house. We got an incredible deal. But thanks for the compliment. I mean, it is a real nice house. Yeah. Secondly, uh, what do you know about me or about my family or about our finances or where our money goes? Do you know anything? No, you don't. So it's a little bit odd to have you pontificating like this. The third thing is, I don't recall inviting you to have an opinion about this. Did I solicit your opinion on this? Have I invited you into my life? I haven't. But the fourth thing, and it's a really important thing, and I, I, I was being a little sarcastic, and I was smiling and good-hearted about this, but I, I basically said, are you sure you want to throw stones on this thing? Because well, I'm wondering, how, how much did your house cost? And so he kind of proudly said, well, I used to live in your kind of house, but I sacrificed it, and, and now I'm, I'm, the house I live in in the inner city is worth $100,000, a real cheap house. $100,000. Uh, and, and how big is it? And he goes, well, it's a small house. It's 1,500 square feet. So 1,500 square feet. Okay. How many people live in that house? 
And he said, well, it's my wife and myself and my uh, daughter. So three people in a 1,500-square-foot house that cost $100,000. You sure you want to throw stones at me here? Because I'm, I'm betting that it's, it's even got internal plumbing, doesn't it, huh? Probably even heating. And if it does, you see, that puts you in the top 10% in the world, in the world. And so what you're doing with me right now, someone, the 90% below you could be doing towards you. So are you, do, do we really want to play this game? Is there any, you know, can we just call off the judgment pit bulls and say that unless someone's invited you in in your life, there's really no point in trying to probe in there and judge them. You see, we're always self-selective in our judgments. We always bend the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in our, to our own favor. And so we can look to the people who have got more than, than we have, and out of a kind of class resentment, we judge them. Those nasty rich people, those nasty big houses, those nasty cars, and la yada, yada, yada. But unless you're at the bottom of the pecking order globally, there's going to be someone beneath you who can be doing the exact same thing to you. And all of it is driven by idolatry to feel kind of righteous in our victimization because we don't have what they have. This isn't the motive of the kingdom. This isn't the way to move forward here. Now, now here's the thing. It is really true that we all need people in our lives who are able to speak into them. It is true that if we're going to learn to live uh, justly and to live with compassion, we need people, a missional community, a, a community on a mission in our life. And we've given them the right to, if necessary, call us on the carpet with our spending. And they don't do it because they want to judge us, and they don't do it because uh, of, uh, uh, to feel self-righteous. But we do it because we've all agreed that here's how we want to live. We want to be learning how to live more justly and to be, show more compassion towards the poor. So can we help one another? And that is totally appropriate. In fact, it is absolutely necessary. I'm convinced you cannot significantly swim upstream in this consumeristic, materialistic culture if you're going solo. You might for a little while, but the, the suction and the pull of the powers... And the, and the whole consumeristic culture eventually wear us down. We need people around us who can hold us accountable when they see that we're going off track. But if a person hasn't invited you in on their life, if you're not in a covenant relationship with them, if they haven't solicited your opinion, you have no business going there. Whether they're rich or whether they're poor, know what you don't know. Stay humble. Don't go looking for a speck in their eye because you have a two-by-four in your own eye. Your one responsibility towards them would be to bless them and to love them and remember that Jesus died for them and they have unsurpassable worth. And that's the end of it right there. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing in this series, in this series, we're not going to be about trying to think we understand all the things about poverty, judging the poor or trying to fix the poor. But we're also not going to be trying to stick it to the rich. Rather, this whole series is about us as a people saying, how can we learn from one another? How can we grow together? How can we humbly set aside what we think we maybe already know and humbly learn from one another and grow forward in this? We want to live in the question, what does Micah 6 look like here and now for us? Or those who are listening through podcasts, what does it look like in your environment? What does acting justly, uh, living with mercy, loving mercy, and acting humbly look like in your particular culture? And we want to be doing this so that we can all wake up to the ways that the system of the culture and the powers behind the system have co-opted us. Ways that maybe we've sold out. Waking up to ways that we don't act justly, maybe don't show mercy, maybe don't act humbly. But it's not about judging the rich or the poor. It's about staying humble and learning from one another. That's why throughout this whole thing, we'll be talking about relationships and talking about listening and dialogue and learning. But to get there, we have to collapse the judgment mechanism. I want to end this way. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? And I want to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us areas in our life where maybe we have been in judgment, thinking we know. If you're affluent, have you had judgments about the poor that maybe have conveniently kept you from feeling the need to do something about it? If you tend to be more on the poor side of things, have you had judgments against the wealthy? Maybe resentments. 
Will you submit those to the Lord right now? Realizing that you are a sinner saved by grace? You're called to act justly. You are called to uh, show compassion. You are called to be humble. You are not called to police others on how they're acting justly, how they're showing mercy, or how humble they are. So just release it. Can you let it go? Can you let it go? Holy Spirit, help us to be a people who know what we don't know. And therefore, people who humbly listen and learn and grow. And God, stir up in our hearts a desire to confront in our own lives the sin of Sodom. Free us from the stranglehold of that to live out your just and compassionate kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said one last time. God bless you guys. Go out and live justly. The altar is open if you want to come forward for prayer. About 12, 13 years ago, I had an experience that really opened my eyes to some things and has significantly shaped my life. I uh, took a missions trip to Haiti. And for the first time in my life, I really encountered uh, a level of poverty I had never experienced before. I mean, I knew the statistics on poverty. I read the books on poverty. But poverty is something you need to experience. You need to smell it. You need to taste it. Uh, it needs to get into your skin to really understand what it is. And that experience really opened my eyes to things in the Word that I'd never seen before. Just what a high priority uh, taking care of and, and, and being in solidarity with the poor, what a high priority that is uh, for God. And that has significantly shaped my ministry and it's been uh, significantly shaped the ministry of Woodland Hills Church. We're going to be having a conference, Ultimate Compassion, on October 30th and 31st. And we're going to be just in a variety of ways addressing these issues in order to help people rise up and be the radical kingdom social activist that God's called us to be. I want to, with all my heart, encourage you to come and be a part of this. It's going to be great. See you there.